Okay, here we go. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about pulse modulation. And we'll start by talking about pulse amplitude modulation or, or PAM. Now, by and large, these have been replaced with what's called pulse code modulation, where we sample. So these are, these are ways to, to transmit analog waveforms using pulses. Okay, and a couple of different techniques are used. But by and large, these are, are mostly obsolete, but they're, they're, they've been replaced with pulse code modulation where you actually sample the analog signal and turn it into a binary word, you know, 8-bit, 12-bit, 16-bit binary word, and transmit that using, you know, binary waveform. You'll see these are a little different than that. These, these are kind of a hybrid between analog and, digital, they're, you know, they're sampled, they're analog signals, but they are pulses. So here we, we're gonna tr transmit, analog message using pulses, but again, not binary, not a binary pulse train. One feature of this though is that they do allow time division multiplexing. or TDM. Um, so we've talked about frequency division multiplexing where we use different carrier frequencies to transmit different channels. You'll see that these techniques allow themselves, you can actually intersperse different pulses corresponding to different messages. And there are, there are two types of uh, pulse amplitude modulation. There's, there's what's called natural top and then flat top. And we'll talk about both of them, spend a little more time talking about flat top. And in particular, we'll talk about um, uh, the spectra. Now these are really just a step above the ideally sampled waveforms that we talked about last time. So, but they are practical systems as opposed to you know, what we talked about last time, these ideally sampled systems. So, so here, again, let, me, let me try and sketch my, my analog message, M of T. And what natural top PAM looks like is their pulses, again, at uh, TS apart, but the tops of the pulses aren't flat across. That The tops of the pulses actually follow the waveform. So I'm trying to draw them equally spaced here. Hope you get the idea because I'm tired of drawing them. Okay, so, but <laughs> this is called natural top PAM or pulse amplitude modulation. And conceptually, you could you could generate this with just a switch that went back and forth. So if we call the pulse train S of T and our message M of T, okay. Then it's really just turning on and off a switch to allow a portion of the waveform to pass through, you know, during the, during the pulse intervals and then 
turn it off or not pass it through. So this is conceptual, although I guess you could, you know, do this with a, a relay, not at a, not at a really high speed, but a, a practical version of this, a high speed, uh, for high speed switching, you could use a, a transistor to actually pass this through. The mathematical model would just be S of T is MT times PTS of T, where PTS of T is a rectangular pulse train. Okay. Um, and you could model PTS of T as actually just a rectangular pulse convolved with our comb that we had last time. Okay. Uh, one approach to looking at the spectrum, I'm, I'm gonna switch over and start talking about flat top PAM, which tends to be used a little more frequently. But if we wanted to get the spectrum of this, typically what it involves is PTS of T is a periodic waveform. Okay. PTS of T has identically is a pulse train of identical pulses. Okay. Multiply the two together, we get that result. Uh, since this is a periodic deterministic waveform, it has a Fourier series. So we can represent this as a sum of cosines. Okay. So this product becomes um, convolution. So what the spectrum would look like is the spectrum of M of T convolved with, again, there'd be, there'd, you know, there'd be a DC component as I've drawn it here. So there'd be a baseband component, but another, the next frequency would be at one over TS or FS, two FS, three FS. So the spectrum is gonna look a lot like the ideally sampled spectrum that we looked at last time, except for the Fourier coefficients are going to affect the amplitudes of the replicas. We didn't have that last time. All the replicas were exactly the same height. I don't think he goes into any more detail on this on, in the textbook. Uh, and I'm not gonna say any more about it, but we will look at flat top PAM in a little more detail because it, it, is, it is used more frequently. With, with flat top PAM, and it might be such that the height of the pulse is sampled right at the middle of, middle of the pulse, but here I'm gonna show it. We're sampling at the beginning of the pulse. And again, these would be TS apart, okay. And we'll see that we still have to meet the Nyquist criteria with any of these practical sampling methods. So the only difference between flat top PAM and natural top PAM is, is actually the, the shape of the top of the pulse. The spectra are different, of course, because the pulse trains are different. Okay. So here the, we need the pulse duration will come into play. We'll call that capital T. Okay. And again, the, the dash wave form here is my baseband message. And, and this is flat top PAM. Um, you can produce it by a, it's called a sample and hold circuit often abbreviated just S slash H. Okay. And I'm just gonna show it in the block diagram like, like this. 
but it's essentially just sampling every t at a ts rate and then holding that sample for a t duration uh, to produce that to produce that waveform okay let's take a look at in order to get a, a handle on the spectrum we need to get a mathematical model for S of T. So S of T again is the pulse train. Okay. And we can model this as M delta T convolved with H of T, okay. Where M delta T is MT multiplied by our comb. So this is what we actually called our ideally sampled signal last time, M delta T. Or, you know, moving this inside the summation, N equal minus infinity to infinity, M of MTS delta T minus MTS. So we looked at this spectrum last time and saw that it was just, it, the spectrum of this part consisted, uh, sorry, that should be uh, N here is my summation variable, not M. We looked at this last time. This was the, our ideally sampled signal. And the spectra consisted of just replicas of the baseband spectra, spaced FS apart. Okay. And we had to make sure that FS was greater than two times W, the Nyquist rate to prevent aliasing. And then the other part here is H of T. And that's just a rectangular pulse. And so I'm gonna assume it's centered. No, actually it wouldn't be. It would have a width T here. And then the T over two delay. The rect, remember, is centered at T equal to zero. So by delaying it by T over two, I'm, I'm letting this be H of T. Okay. But this is nothing more than, you know, an infinite train of impulses of different weights. The weights correspond to my sample values of my message convolved with pulses. So that convolution just gives me a shifted train of pulses as in that picture. So what's the spectrum? S of F would be M delta F multiplied by H of F, the Fourier, tr the Fourier transform of my H of T signal here. Okay. Where we had M, of F, M delta of F last time. M delta of F is F of S sum N equal minus infinity to infinity of M F minus N F S and H of F is the Fourier transform of that rect is just a, a sink. Okay. Um, so let me try and draw some pictures so we can try and interpret this and see, well, do we still need the Nyquist criteria? Do we need something better? So I'm gonna assume that just to draw some pictures that this is what my baseband spectra looks like. M delta of F 
you know, more importantly, you know, taking a look at the spectra will give us an idea of what we need to do to recover the analog signal from the pulse train here. Okay. We also need to talk about what's the bandwidth, what's the required bandwidth of, of this channel. Okay. But M delta of F, we looked at this last time, it was nothing more than an infinite train of, not really train, I guess, in the frequency domain, but we had all of these replicas. Okay, M delta of F is, again, our, our ideally, the spectrum of our ideally sampled signal. But flat top PAM is nothing more than our ideally sampled signal uh, convolved with these pulses or in the frequency domain, that convolution results in, corresponds to the multiplication of M delta of F and, a, and H of F. Okay. Now, <laughs> since T here is smaller than TS, my sampling interval, right? If T were equal to TS, then I, I would actually have my original curve. But since T is smaller than TF, my zero in my sink is going to be that zero location, one over T is going to be greater than one over TS. Okay, so this looks like a doesn't look much like a sink because I've really stretched it out to show the relative scale. This is, this first zero is actually at one over T and minus one over T, okay. But this is just showing that sink function that we've seen before, but it's really stretched out because of the relationship between T and one over TS, okay. So multiplying these two things together, to get S of F, and I'm not, so I wanna draw what, the, what these two things look like multiplied together. Now notice if this were a constant, I would get this thing exactly. It's not a constant. So I'm gonna have some distortion over even this, this spec, this replica that's a baseband. The others are going to be even more severely distorted. Okay. One out here at two FS, let's say that corresponds to where the zero is, you know, that might look really crazy. Okay. So whatever picture you hear doesn't matter too much other than, you know, I'm trying to show that what we had with the ideally sampled case was the spectra and then exact replicas of it. Now, because of, with the uh, uh, flat top PAM, in the frequency domain, we have that ideally sampled spectrum times a sync function. So our replicas are distorted versions okay. of what we had in the ideally sampled case. Okay. Distorted version of M delta F. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't recover our original spectrum. We can see here, I, you know, I can low pass filter and recover this thing, 
which is a distorted version of M of F, but the distortion is known here. Okay. So if I can do something like an inverse filter to do this, undo the distortion, I might be okay. okay. The other thing is, it may not even be necessary <coughs> if T of S um, is uh, large enough relative to my pulse width or my pulse width is really small, you know, th this zero crossing is gonna be way out here. And so this looks, you know, constant enough over that interval that there may not be noticeable distortion. But even if there is, it's possible to recover the undistorted system. That's called equalization. So a low pass filter will pass only the portion of S of F between plus or minus W. So I'm gonna call this, not, so this would be at my receiver. So, you know, at my transmitter, I'm using this flat top, I'm generating this flat top pulse train and then transmitting it over some media. It might be fiber optic, might be coaxial cable, might be wire. Okay. Now <clears throat> at the receiver, if I low pass filter that pulse wave form, I'm gonna get this spectra. This would actually be a, a continuously varying signal, okay. but it's a distorted version of my original M of F, which I'm trying to recover. So this is distorted, distorted version of M of F or equivalently, you know, M of T. Okay. And so there, there's two techniques to reduce the distortion. One is there's less distortion as T decreases relative to, to TS. So smaller pulses, and the smaller pulses is are, they're really approaching those impulses and the limit where I didn't have distortion. And for T less than one tenth of my sampling interval, the distortion is less than 0.5%, so perhaps acceptable. Okay, I haven't actually even talked about how to measure distortion, but we will. But another approach is we can actually eliminate the distortion. using an, what's called an equalization filter. Which we'll call H E Q of F. Okay. So what we want for H E Q of F is it should be the reciprocal of H of F, right? So, you know, uh, generating this spectra by multiplying my ideally sampled spectra by H of F. So if I multiply by one over H of F, I'll recover this. Okay. So one over T sync of FT. Okay. I really only have to do that over 
the frequency band which I have frequency content oh, only over the, the, the frequencies that contain that, that low free, that zero frequency spectra. Okay. So kind of what this would look like minus W to W is like this inverse sink. Okay one, the reciprocal of that. So, you know, if that is one at the origin, it's one here, and then that decreases, so this will decrease. I really don't care what happens outside that range, okay? I just need to undo the distortion in the frequency interval containing And then I've recovered the original spectra, recovered the original M of T by doing that. Okay. So the idea is on my receiver now, I have a low pass filter and then an equalization filter. And then now the resulting, I'll call it M, double delta should be, you know, if this were all exact, I should recover my original, original message here. Okay. Now, interestingly, I don't have to have this here, this equalization filter here. I could actually have it before my low pass filter. That would be fine. I could even, move it into the transmitter, which takes a little bit of thinking about, where I could actually deliberately distort the spectrum here, you know, kind of what, what this is doing is kind of attenuating some of the higher frequencies relative to the lower frequencies. Well, I could kind of amplify those higher frequencies here so that I pre-distort, so that with this pre-distortion filter, you know, I get some sort of spectrum like this. And then now with this distortion, this thing is going to look just like my original spectrum. Okay. It's not the only example of where this is actually used in communications a lot, actually. Dolby noise reduction, which most, some of you have probably heard of, it's quite common to, to actually get rid of high frequency hiss on cassette, on tape media. But there, before they actually recorded on tape, they would deliberately distort, amplify the high frequency portion of the signal so that when you played it back, you ran it through a filter that actually attenuated the high frequencies, thereby attenuating the noise but since you had pre-distorted the message by attenuating the high frequencies, it was really an inverse filter and you recovered the original signal, but with attenuated noise at playback. Um, we'll see that actually something like that is actually done with FM as well, because of when we start um, talking more, we'll come back to FM with digital FM. We'll see that um, there's a, uh, a uh, pre-distortion filter that's used with, with FM as well. Okay. There are some other techniques, some other parameters that you can vary of a pulse train. So just like we looked at with analog multi modulation, changing or modulating parameters of a sine wave, either the amplitude or the frequency or phase, there are different parameters that we can modulate or change in a pulse train. We can change the amplitude in uh, proportion to our baseband message. You could also change the width or duration 
That's called pulse width modulation. Uh, some of you may have actually seen that in 454 for DC motor control. You're not actually trying to recover. You're actually just changing the average value of a, of a signal sent to a DC motor, but you can actually use that same technique for transmitting an analog message. You would just change the width of each pulse in proportion to the analog message. Another one is pulse position modulation. You could change the position relative to its rest position and transmit analog information that way. So we could vary the pulse duration or width. So this is called either PDM in the book or other textbooks will often refer to it as pulse width modulation, PWM, or the pulse position for PPM proportionally to the message. And here, instead of trying to draw what these look like, just pulled a picture from the textbook. So you get, I think, and you, you've probably seen these before. So here's the, the unmodulated pulse train. Okay. And then here's pulse width modulation. Where the, amplitude, where the amplitude is large, you increase the, the, the width of the corresponding pulse that you would transmit. When the amplitude is low, you would decrease the width relative to its rest width or natural width. So this is pulse width modulation or pulse duration modulation. And when we have to look at the spectra and the spectra of these are, are, are much more complex to, to see how to recover the, the waveform. And actually this one's pretty easy. It can be recovered with just a low pass filter. This is pulse position modulation. It's a little bit hard to, to visualize here, but when the amplitude is large, it's moved to the right relative to its rest position. Okay. And the larger the amplitude, the further to the right it moves. You know, at zero here, these should actually line up. But when it goes negative, then it's moved to the left relative to its rest position. Notice the, the pulse widths are all the same here with pulse position modulation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because phase would be related to time, a time shift, yeah. And these typically aren't used these days for analog modulation, but, and, but, it, it, but this is not related to pulse phase modulation we'll see with digital modulation. That's actually just a change in phase. Uh, so it's, some advantages and disadvantages. Pulse division modulation uses more power than pulse position modulation. Pulse position, of course, the power here is going to be related to the duration of the pulse and how long it's high. That never changes with pulse position modulation. So the average power with pulse position modulation actually is, is fixed. Okay. Um, we can model PPM as S of T is minus infinity to infinity, G of T minus NTS, where G is our pulse shape minus K, P, M, N, T, S. This is just a time shift in the pulse that's proportional to our message. So where 
GT is our pulse. Okay. Um, another condition you have to meet with, with pulse modulation, you have to make sure that the pulse position change isn't so great that it overlaps the next pulse in the train to prevent overlap, you have to meet an, ad an additional condition, KP MT max has to be less than TS over two. Okay. So this, in addition to the Nyquist criteria. Okay. So the Nyquist criteria doesn't depend on the amplitude at all, right? This is an additional criteria that says, you know, you have to make sure that this KP parameter here times the maximum amplitude is less than TS over two. Otherwise you'll get this pulse possibly overlapping the one that where you may have at the negative amplitude and get pulse overlap and then not be able to recover in that case. Okay. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we'd spend a lot more time on these topics than we do now. I cover them in just one lecture just to mention them because for the rest of the semester, and at least with, with regard to digital, we'll be talking about pulse code modulation. So sampling, converting to a binary word, and then transmitting those binary values. So, uh, none of this, you know, the, the binary pulses all have fixed amplitude, fixed position, fixed width. So none of these are really analog modulation techniques for recovering the, the analog signal. Okay. It's, it's well, they're kind of hybrid because we are sampling the analog. Any questions about this? I did send out an email. I don't know if everyone received it. I got a list from, from Vicki of the seniors, but apparently there were several people who were missing off that list. So if you didn't get that email, send me an email and I'll, I'll forward you that message. But it, it was just about the, the social media thing to, to get your picture and uh, answers to a few questions posted on social media, if you wanna do that. But if you didn't get that email, let, send me an email and I'll be sure to include you. That's it for today. So I think our next exam is after we finish this chapter. So about two weeks away, is that correct? The 30th? Okay. So yeah, a week from a week from Friday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the third test will be at the end of the semester. It, it's, it, yeah, it's, I'm not giving a, I'm not giving a final in here. The finals are all, the finals week is after Thanksgiving and they're all online. I'm not going to do online finals.